Well, I'm really happy to have a chance to get together with you and share this because this has been very, very helpful to me. And let me just begin by drawing this on the board here and saying when the Bible begins, it begins with the very, very significant words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1.1. It's most fundamental in understanding the Bible. Because this means that there was a beginning. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were there. And they said, let there be. In fact, if you read the scripture, they actually conferred together as the creation was going on. Now, God, of course, was already there. Because God never had a beginning. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are eternal. And we have trouble getting our minds around that, but nonetheless, that's the way the Bible explains it. He's always been, and there's no way to disprove that. We accept it by faith, and he has revealed what he wants us to know about himself. And so he tells us in the beginning of the book, in the beginning. Now that doesn't mean, see, the beginning of him. That's the beginning of creation. Because he's eternal. All right? Now, it was he who decided to create everything. And including man and woman. And this is very, very important to anybody who reads the Bible, because what this means is that I now can answer the question from the Bible, who am I? And the Bible tells me that I'm not a speck of protoplasm floating on a sea of meaninglessness, like one scientist said, but actually I'm a creature made by God. And after his image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, as one of the catechisms says. That answers a big question for our culture today, and that is the question, who am I? I am made by God. That tells me two things. It tells me I have value. You can't put enough zeros after you to show how valuable you are as a creature made by God. And he has made us as immortal beings, which means we have the beginning, but we exist forever. That's how valuable we are. But secondly, the, the Bible tells us here that man has a purpose. God had a plan when he created everything and created man. And then he put him on the earth in a place called the Garden of Eden. And that Garden of Eden was a place where it needed somebody to take care of it. And so God said to Adam, and later with his, we, his wife, Eve, to take care of it for him. Now in the middle of that garden, there was one particular tree. And God said to Adam, whom he named him, don't eat of that tree. I mean, you can eat from anything else in the garden you want to, but don't eat from that tree. And what God was doing here was giving him the opportunity 
to make a choice to choose to love him and to serve him or to choose to go independent. This is what the situation was. Now, the Bible tells us there was a fallen angel by the name of Satan who comes on the scene in this picture. He comes in in the form of a serpent. Now, I can't tell you how a serpent talks, but this one did. And uh, he talked to the woman whom God had created to be Adam's helper. And he said, uh, has God said you shouldn't eat of every tree? No, she said, we can eat of every tree there is, but this one. Because God tells us in the day that we eat from that tree, we will we will die. And Satan said to her, you won't die. Actually, you'll be smarter because you'll know, know, now know the difference between good and evil by experience. And the Bible tells us, of course, that under the temptation of the devil, she ate and she gave it to her husband, Adam, and he ate. And they immediately died spiritually. They were still alive, but they were dead spiritually in terms of their relationship to God. That had been terribly, terribly marred. And they immediately felt ashamed. So they tried to cover themselves up because they had been naked, see, and with no problem. But once they had eaten of the tree, they felt shame. They felt guilt. They knew they had done something wrong. And Adam tried to hide. He went back into the forest to try to hide from God. They both had made fig leaf aprons to cover their bodies and so God confronts them where are you and he said to them have you eaten of the tree well Adam said my wife Eve did it she is the one who started and gave it to me so he comes to Eve and says, is that true? And he says, well, the serpent tempted me, and I did it. And God says to the serpent something that is all the way through the scripture. And it's fundamental. Genesis 3, 15. God said to that serpent, I will put alienation or enemy, you'll be enemies with the woman and her seed. It shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. And in a picture there, God was telling Adam and Eve that one day someone who was the seed of the woman would crush evil and the devil. And that promise covers the whole Bible. And what happens is that the Bible tells us how God's going to do it. Every bit of the Bible from now on is in that framework. Okay? Now, that promise, and it was a promise, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, was passed down to the generations. It went down to Noah at the time of the great flood. Later, it went down to a man by the name of Abraham. And Abraham was told that through his seed, the nations of the world would be blessed. His name was Isaac. Isaac had two sons, and 
the one through whom it went would be Jacob, whose name later was changed to Israel. And Israel, Jacob, had 12 sons, and the promise was to come down through Judah, whose descendants are popularly known as Jews. So, here they are now, with this promise. The rest of the Bible is going to tell us how that's fulfilled. But the uh, children of Israel, Jacob, multiplied. And it ended up they went down to Egypt because it was a great famine. And the Bible tells us about that. In, this is all in Genesis. And uh, they went down there, and they were down there for 430 years. And they were, in the meantime, enslaved. They became actual slaves of the Egyptians. But here God had this promise for them. So he raised up a man by the name of Moses, and he led them out. Now, it's very interesting how he led them out. Because when they were ready to go, he told all of these Israelites, take a, take a lamb and kill the lamb, catch the blood, take the blood and splash it on the doorposts and on the lintel over above. Because I'm going to come through Egypt and I'm going to kill the firstborn of every Egyptian. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Have you heard of the Passover? Yeah. Yeah. That's where it came from. The angel would pass over where he saw the blood. And there was a picture clear back there of how God was going to deliver his people. Now we're now down into the second book of the Bible, which is Exodus. So that happened. He actually came to Egypt, this death angel. The children of Israel, if they were believers, they would do this. And they were in their homes, and they stayed in there with the blood on the door. The angel passed over, and every firstborn of the Egyptians died that night, which was enough to persuade the Egyptians to get those people out there, out of there. So they were ready to release them. God led them miraculously across the Red Sea. Moses was at the helm and he brought them to a place called Sinai. I'm going to call this creation, okay? And here, I'm going to call this Sinai. Sinai is a mountain on the south or southern tip of the Sinaitic Peninsula, which you can visit today. It's over there between Egypt and, and Israel. And uh, God told them to come there. So Moses led the people to the foot of the mountain of Sinai. And something happened there. He gave them his law at that point. Perhaps you've heard of it. The Ten Commandments? Yeah. Okay. God gave them His law, and here were these Ten Commandments. Now, a lot of people misunderstand these because they often think if they keep the Ten Commandments, you know, they can get to heaven. But uh, the interesting thing was that the people were already saved. They had been delivered from captivity, and now God wanted them to live a certain way. The problem was that with the knowledge of the law also comes the knowledge of sin. You remember the little um, rhyme that said, uh, little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating his Christmas pie? He stuck in his thumb, pulled out a plum, and said, what a good boy am I. 
Now let me tell you, when a person takes the Ten Commandments, though many of the men I've talked to try to do this, tell me they're going to be saved for eternity by keeping the Ten Commandments. I actually had a man here in Pittsburgh who, whose name was Adam, would you believe? And that's what he told me. And uh, so I said, well, let's see how, do, how well you're doing. So I started quoting these things, and he kept saying, and you know, for the first time in his life, he came to understand that the thing that he thought was going to save him was going to condemn him. See, the question is, why does man do what he does? Why do men and women fight? Why do they get in scraps? Why do we get bad attitudes? Why do we end up doing things we wish we'd never done? And then we end up then even having wars. Well, the reason is fundamentally because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. All have sinned. In Adam, who sinned, we all died. Now, otherwise, we would never die. But God said, in the day you eat thereof, you'll die. So, we are sinners. We're lawbreakers. We haven't kept those Ten Commandments. None of us has. But, God didn't give that to us in order to, for us, if we kept it, we could be, uh, go to heaven. No. Never. So what was that for? That was to teach us what am I like? And the answer in the Bible is I'm a lawbreaker. Now the question comes up then, how can lawbreakers actually fellowship with a holy God? How can we have contact with Him? How can we have fellowship with Him since we're sinners? And God can't look upon sin. Sin is, of course, a breaking of His law. It's an affront to His person. It's just telling Him, as Adam and Eve did, they just paid no attention to what He said and did their own way. That's the nature of sin. And so, the question comes, how could these people whom he had called out of Egypt, who were special people under this promise of that one who would crush the head of the serpent, how could these people worship with a holy God? So God gave them a process by which they could be acceptable with him. And here's the way it worked. He gave them a tabernacle or a large tent. He set aside one of the tribes of Jacob to be priests. And what they would do would be they would worship God by coming to this tent. And as they worshiped, they would bring an animal and they would offer a lamb generally if they were rich they would a, give a bull but anyway there had to be the shedding of blood it's by the shedding of blood that there would be remission of sins now all of this was a picture you remember the promise was clear back here that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent and clear back here in Sinai centuries before that was going to happen, they are now being accepted by God through a sacrifice where blood was shed. There was death. And they placed their hands on the animal, which was symbolic of the passing of guilt onto the animal, and then the animal had to die. Okay? Does that make sense? So even... Even those people who had a promise from God, they 
they couldn't just approach him. They they still had guilt, or or they still couldn't come into uh, fellowship with him or anything like that. Not without sacrifice. Because remember, he had been told that he would die. And the only way that God was going to bring this about was by a substitute. And here is it's all being predicted, see? They're looking ahead to what's going to happen. And if you read your Bible, you read all about David and Solomon and, and all the kings of Israel. They were carried off into captivity. They came back again, but they're always looking ahead to this one that was to come who was going to redeem them, to save them, really. And so when you come over to the New Testament, this is, by the way, this is Old Testament, or what I will call the Old Covenant. This was the covenant arrangement. That's what covenant means. It's an arrangement, you know, between parties. Yeah. All right, when we come over into the New Testament, something special is going to happen. Because God sent his son Jesus to earth. He came and was born as a man. If you know the story, if you've heard it, there was a girl, teenager, by the name of Mary, who was visited by an angel. And the angel said, Mary, you're going to have a son. Well, she said, how can I have a son? I don't know. I've not had intercourse with anybody. Said the son that's going to be born in your womb is going to be the Son of God. He will be special. So the Virgin Mary conceived of this baby. Now she was engaged and uh, you can imagine how Joseph, her fiancé, might have felt, you know, when he knows that she's pregnant. But an angel came to him, too, and said, No, the boy that's going to be born to her, it will be the Son of God. So you don't need to feel backward about taking her to be your wife. So he did. So we have this now, a man on earth who has actually come from God. Well, he grew up in the home of his parents. His dad was a carpenter. He grew up in Nazareth. He had been born in Bethlehem, went to Egypt, then came up settled in Nazareth. And at the age of 30, he came now to do what had been told to do. Remember, the seed of the woman was to come, historically. And here he now comes. And uh, he was now 30 years of age. There was a man that predicted his coming by the name of John the Baptizer. He was nicknamed that way because he was baptizing people. And that baptism signified, you know, cleansing of their sin. That was the, that was the picture. But one day he saw Jesus, who was now 30 years of age, and he pointed him out and he said, Look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you know, that's in John 1, 29. It's an interesting picture when you stop and think about it. The Lamb of God. Now what did the Lamb symbolize back here? A substitute death. 
okay, so they could be received. Now, here comes the Lamb of God. And who's about to offer the sacrifice now? God. That's what makes him amazing. God is actually going to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the world. So, John baptized Jesus, and Jesus then began his ministry. He was 30 years of age, as I said, and he went about doing good. You know, the wonderful thing was that, that uh, he could heal the sick. He actually cured some blind people. He helped deaf people hear. And on some occasions, he actually raised people from the dead. And, you know, people were amazed. Something's different about this man. All kinds of questions came up. Now, the religious leaders did not like him because they felt he was running competition with them. And besides that, they didn't look upon the way uh, the people the way God did, who cared for them. They were proud, and they were they were hard on people. And Jesus, who loved people and was going there and helping them, they did not like him. They tried to figure out what they could do. Now he preached as well, and he told people that they were sinners. He told them that God was love and that he had provided a way for them to be saved. All kinds of things were there. And that's in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those early books of the second half. See, we're, we're at a very crucial point here in this whole thing. In fact, we're now ready to come into what's known as the New Testament with the coming of the Lamb of God. The seed of the woman has now arrived. So as I say, he went about doing good. Uh, people were helped. But the religious leaders wanted to get rid of him. Amazing. So they drummed up charges against him and brought him before the Roman Tribune and criticized him and said he should be put to death. Well, the Roman leader, Pilate, was not sure about this because he knew that they were envious of him. Jesus now had crowds following him instead of them. And uh, so they were jealous. And Pilate, the Roman governor knew this. He could sense it. And he couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus to put him to death like they asked him to do. He says, so why? What has he done? Well, they drummed up charges and said he was in competition with Caesar. And under the pressure, the political pressure, Pilate actually issued a decree that he was to be crucified. So at a place outside of Jerusalem, a place called Calvary, they crucified Jesus. Let me just put that word Calvary there. The Bible says that he was put to death with two thieves beside him, and there he died. And the interesting thing was now God was now offering a sacrifice for sin. Here was God's way of saying, I will accept this son of mine as the Lamb of God 
for all who will put their trust in him. His blood was worth that. So, on that eventful day, they crucified him. And he died. And he was buried. You've heard of Easter. Have you had it? People like to celebrate Easter in commemoration of that occasion. But you see, the purposes of God were now being fulfilled. The rulers thought they had gotten rid of him. But the amazing thing was, three days later, he came back to life. He rose from the dead. And many, many people saw him. Paul the Apostle, who was a later convert, wrote about that and said, I delivered unto you of first importance how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. First importance, that he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And it wasn't long after that that he assembled his disciples and told them that he was going back to heaven and that's what he did out there on the road to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us they were standing out there and there were two angels who were there the men were looking up into heaven because they'd seen him go. These angels said, Why are you looking into heaven? This same Jesus whom you've seen go into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. So the Bible tells us that Jesus went back to heaven, but that he's coming again. Now what question this answers is, what do I need? And the Bible answers that by saying, I need somebody to cover my sin. Because the sin, the soul that sinneth it shall die, the Bible says. And so the Bible calls men to Jesus as God's offering for sin to meet my need as a sinner. Now, let me tell you what continues to happen here, because the story, the Bible story, continues a little bit more. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come again at the end of the world, and he'll come and make a judgment. You've heard of hell, you've heard of heaven, well, he will be making a judgment. And the question will be whether it will be heaven or hell for me. If I have had Christ, if I have come to Christ, the Bible says it will, it will be heaven. If I reject him, The answer is hell. And that's where there is a lake of fire. Revelation 20 makes that very clear. Hell is horrible. Heaven will be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so that's what's going to happen to me. The Bible tells me I am going to meet Jesus when he comes. And he's going to make a decision. If I have come to him to get my need met, the Bible says, I will be with him in heaven 
in the new heavens and the new earth. There'll be a restoration. I can't give you the details of that, but it's all good. We'll be with him. Sin will be no more. We will be resurrected to new bodies. New, it's wonderful. The horror of hell it goes beyond words. But it's the idea of being cut off from God forever. Eternity. Never, never any hope for change. It's, and you can, you can almost wonder if that lake of fire is the burning conscience within a man or woman knowing that they rejected what God, who created them, provided. Well, does that make any sense? What what does it specifically, um, I believe you said, come to Jesus? What does that mean, to come to Jesus? Okay, that's really the right question. Let me give it to you the way Jesus gave it. Look at it like this. God so loved the world, okay, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What it means is turning one's life over to God in repentance, coming to him and asking forgiveness for one's sins, and in the name of Jesus Christ, asking him to be your savior. There's nothing we can do because he has done it all. He kept the law for us and then took the penalty of our sin. And now calls all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Did Jesus, uh, I'm still thinking about what you were saying in Sinai that even these people who had this promise still had to present uh, the blood for their forgiveness But if, so Jesus was born from Mary, which I guess meaning in some senses he would be like us. Was there not a sacrifice that he would have had to present as well? Or is it because he was the promise that yeah. there was no need yeah. for a sacrifice? You, 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 you know what we mean by the virgin birth? Uh, just that she uh, didn't come to have a baby as normally In a normal way, way. Yeah. that's right. You see, the promise was linked to what God was going to do. And he gave them a sign that was going to lead up to the coming of Jesus. And it was the seed of the woman, and it was symbolized by circumcision. Mm -hmm. The cutting of the skin of the male organ that was a sign that was the sign of the covenant. And the people who believed in this covenant, all the men were circumcised as part of the sign that they belonged to the people of God. Now that didn't save them, but it was like baptism. You know, Jesus said, believe, on, on the, believe the gospel and be baptized. And so there is a symbol there of the washing. Well, this was a sign of his promise of the coming one. And of course, once he had come, circumcision no longer applied. It was fulfilled. But now 
it's faith in the seed of the woman. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So what happens in between that time where uh, so someone uh, comes to Jesus um, what does uh, the question was what's going to happen to me but that was referring to the end so what happens to someone who comes to Jesus from I guess that moment to the end till the end of his life yeah. well he begins to live his life for Jesus instead of for himself he lives for God see what man has always done is put God on the side and all that you know they, they want his best but they don't want to serve him because he's a sinner once he becomes a child of God he loves God God loves him and the fellowship is there and now what does God want me to do for example, Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, which is the call of God, and follow me. And so a person is taught how to walk with God. And that's the people of God, which are known as the church. <clears throat> 